So uh, I really uh, welcome all of you in the kickoff meeting of the e-test project. And I'm extremely happy to see how many, that many person attending our meeting. And uh, this is the agenda that we will, uh, we will go through today. So you see there will be, of course, the introduction, some gen general information, and then four very deep scientific presentation to really explain the activity that will be realized in this project. So I see there are still a lot of people coming, but uh, uh, Mr. Willy Borsu, Hello, Hello, good morning. Hello. <laughs> where is where are you? I would like to see your, your camera. <laughs> yes, I am uh, in my office in Namur. I will already introduce uh, Mr. Willy Borsu, our vice president of Wallonia in Belgium and the minister for economy, foreign trade, research and innovation, digital agriculture, spatial planning, IFAPME and competence centers. And we have the big privilege to have Mr. Borsu with us and to uh, that he will do the, the opening of this uh, great kickoff. Good morning. Thank you. Are you available? Yes, we are. You have the floor, Mr. Borsu. Thank you. Thank you so much and sorry for this uh, short delay. Uh, dear partners, uh, company CEO, Mr. De Mayor, uh, directors, professors, researchers, and uh, engineers, uh, dear Pierre, Mr. Director, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in your various uh, uh, capacities and qualities. Uh, it is thanks to the very uh, high quality of our universities, our scientists, and our knowledge in aerospace and also high technology, that this kind of a project is possible. This project embodies a sector, scientific and aerospace, that uh, occupies a prominent place also in uh, our Walloon economy. That's why uh, the government is so strongly committed in favor of the development of this sector, which represents a so large asset for the future, for our common future. And the economic impact for the region can only be beneficial. This project involves many companies and will uh, prompt them to innovate, reinvent uh, themselves and work with other businesses from different fields. The effects of the, the building and then uh, the operation of such a, a research tool will be much more than significant. The construction of this unprecedented infrastructure alone will involve a wide range of disciplines geology, instrumentation with ultra powerful lasers, and so on and so on. And this will result in new technological developments that create new challenges and which can then be used elsewhere in an exciting area of application, such as, by example, medical imaging. A tool such as this will attract researchers and will be of benefit in both academic circles and for businesses providing a technological leap forward and a quality level, level. It will provide a real boost for the scientific reputation of our countries and our regions. This project is very much dedicated on the future and that is a unique combination of scientific knowledge, skills, know, and technology. This type of infrastructure will generate industrial and economic activity 
as well as employment and huge amounts of added value. In short, it will create a tremendous boost for the economy, for our economy. As you know, Wallonia is, amongst others, of course, an international leader in the space industry and will now be able to write with you a new and important page in the history of science. The space business in Wallonia is a growth area that currently unites some 30 more or less companies and research centers, providing a total of 1,800 direct jobs, most of them high-tech jobs, of course, and generating an annual turnover of some around 350 million euros. These figures, impressive as they are, only reflect the industrial activities of the industry itself. They do not take account of the huge positive knock-on effect that the space sector generates in both scientific but also societal terms, nor do, to, nor do to they include the transfer of space-related technologies to other types of industrial and uh, scientific applications. To support this sector, and as Walloon Minister for the Economy and Research, I wish to work in very practical ways to instigate a mutually beneficial collaboration with other European partners, players, and with the various bodies, amongst them federal bodies, in the space industry, as well as to support our entrepreneurial and industrial aims by providing ambitious level of funding, in particular via the regional uh, space fund, by example, in our uh, regional companies, companies, uh, SREW and some others, but also to strengthen the support that Wallonia provides to the companies and also start the businesses involved in the space industry. We also intend to continue a policy that support the process of making young people more aware of science and space. As I, as I have said, the space industry is essential for the future of our region, of our countries, or of our regions. That's why we are going to ensure that the sector competitiveness is developed further and that we are able to achieve better cooperation between the various players. While Wallonia is already supporting a large range of projects and intends to continue doing so, I am thinking especially of support from the region to the proposed Einstein, Einstein telescope, but also of, of our support for the projects to expand the Liège Space Center, and also for the European Space Center in Redu. I just finish by, men by mentioning that the direct involvement of Wallonia in funding research in the space industry amounts to several million euros per year. That delivered uh, via assistance for projected competitiveness clusters or via direct aid. As you can see, the government's aim uh, to uh, position itself as a real partner for companies in the sector. I aim to make uh, our region a choice for industrial and scientific research, as well as for the space industry training and also development of new projects. I thank you for 
all the work done. I wish you the best for this uh, uh, working day. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, listen to you, to discuss with you, and to have uh, this uh, working area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Borsu. Thank you very much for your support and the support of the Walloon region. And uh, I will now uh, welcome the next uh, speaker. So it's uh, Mr. Mark Voss, Interreg EMR Program Coordinator at the Netherlands. Hi, good morning, everyone. So also we are very happy to be part of this uh, uh, very important project for the region as uh, As the minister already told, uh, this project is very important and has uh, a lot of uh, capacities for the future concerning science and so on. So we are very happy as Interreg uh, that we are part of uh, this project. I have a short presentation to show you what we are doing as Interreg and what we are standing for. Okay, I want to say something about Interact, what is Interact, what is the state of play of the actual program, what is Interact in this project e-test, and what are the next uh, steps in our program. So first of all, what is Interact? Interact is one of the, the key instruments of the European Union uh, in supporting cooperation across borders through project funding. And this e-test is one of those projects. The aim is to jointly tackle common challenges and find shared solutions in fields such as health, environment, research, education, transport, sustainable energy, and, and a lot of more. We in the region MERS-RAN have a long history with uh, cooperation across borders, more than 30 years. And uh, as long as Interreg exists in Europe, we are one of the projects, one of the programs in, in the Interreg community in Europe. Europe uh, foresaw 10 billion ERDF funding in this program period, 2014-2020. We are almost at the end of uh, the actual program period. It's ending in 2023. In total, Europe has more than 100 uh, interact program, of which 60 are cross-border programs, and we are one of those six cross-border programs. Okay, next uh, slide. What is the state of play? I want to show you a short video. It takes a few minutes uh, to show what we are doing and where we are standing for. Let me introduce you to our region. The Interreg, your region news line, hosts around 5.5 million inhabitants, more than 400,000 companies and 180 billion euros BNP. Region is the backdrop for our program that promotes the collaboration between 13 regions from Belgium, Germany, and the Netherlands. Instead of reinventing the wheel, we work together and learn from each other. That means that we stop wasting time and money and foster innovative ideas. With the help of the European Union, experts from the border triangle not only overcome country borders, but also language barriers. Interreg Eurasia Views Right is part of the Interreg Cooperation Program since the very beginning. Interreg EMR also builds on cooperation in the region dating back even further. 400 projects in the 30 year history of Interreg in our region. In 2014 to 2020, the European Union invests 96 million euros from the European Regional Development Fund in the areas of innovation, economy, social inclusion, education, and territorial development. Some of the most recent cooperation projects are Puma supports SMEs in advanced composite manufacturing to demonstrate feasibility, quality, and productivity. It uses advanced technologies such as additive manufacturing, virtual engineering, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and robotics. The Interreg Project e-test is a very important step of the Einstein telescope, as it will be a proof of concept both on the prototype side and on the geological side. This project is a major scientific breakthrough, but will also have a significant economic impact on SMEs in the Eurasia News Rhyme. Recent discoveries have shown that muscle stem cells can induce the production of healthy muscle fibers. The Generate Your Muscle project will test such a muscle stem cell therapy. 
Specifically, it will address the therapy safety and effectiveness for patients with muscle disorders. Ultimately, the project wants to scale up muscle stem cell production in a new spin-off company. This should make the therapy affordable and broadly available. In the context of the ongoing COVID-19 crisis, the Internet Your Region Use Right program opened a special projects call. To open to initiatives to promote crisis response in the context of the COVID 19 outbreak in the health, public, and security services, public administrative management, and social services sector. Five projects were selected to better arm the border region against the COVID 19 pandemic. We are looking forward to seeing the project ideas in action soon. So that's what we have done in those 30 years. Uh, as we show in this video, ITAS is one of uh, the most important uh, projects in our program. Uh, we funded with uh, more than 7 uh, million uh, ERDF. So a very important uh, project. Perhaps the next screen. Yeah, as we already told, uh, for the scientists from Belgium, Germany, and the Netherlands, they are coming together in, in this project. So very important for the major scientific breakthroughs in our region. But there's also a significant uh, economic impact. Uh, we expect that in, for the small and medium-sized enterprises in our region. The minister already told that also. So we are looking forward to see the results of this uh, wonderful project uh, and we are happy to cooperate with you and also mr einstein would be happy to see this project so we are excited to accompany you and see you in the project results what are the next steps in our program and we are working now on the the next program perhaps the next uh, slide But in the meantime, the call six is open. That's uh, probably our last call to, to look for a project. The submissions can be hand in by the 10th of November. So if you have uh, new ideas or some people of you are perhaps working on a new uh, project, we are looking forward to it. And uh, as I said, probably the last call, you have uh, 20 million to spend, 20 million ERDF to spend in this program period. And submission date is 10 November. And now, for the next program period, uh, we are working on content. We will uh, introduce uh, the program content for in a, in a public uh, stakeholders meeting, which will come in probably November, to see if the content we are proposing fits with all the stakeholders in our uh, region. So you are welcome to give your comments and give ideas for those new program periods. We are preparing it now and watch our website or social media to be updated and we will keep you updated via those uh, social media. So welcome to give us advice, to give us ideas. So more info you can find here. I wish you good luck with this project. We are looking forward to see those wonderful uh, results. Thank you for your attention and have a nice morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark, for this very nice uh, presentation and all the opportunities that we have thanks to the uh, Interreg program. So we are very happy to, to welcome Professor Pierre Wolper, who is the rector of the University of Liège in Belgium. So, Mr. Wolper. Good morning to everyone. Can Hello. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Very good. Well, first, welcome to everybody. Welcome to the University of Liège. Usually, I would try to show you some of the university. Here, all you have to see is the insides of some offices. But I, let me tell you a few words about our university. We are a, a medium-sized university with 25,000 students and about 5,000 members of staff. We operate in, in a rather wide variety of areas because we have 11 faculties. And we also have a strong tradition of interaction between areas and also innovative projects. Some of the areas in which we are very active in are the life sciences 
And I'll just say a few words about what we're doing now in the context of the COVID-19 crisis, which is to develop tests to detect the presence of the virus, tests which are based on um, sampling saliva rather than going through the nose and, and uh, getting the sample from the back of the, the nose, which is very easy to do. And so we are now in the program of testing all our students and staff. Of course, finding some positive cases, but having the opportunity to uh, tell them that they are positive, inform them about their positive status, even though a lot of them didn't know about it, and giving them the opportunity to withdraw from our life, academic life for a good week and so avoid spreading the epidemic. In space, we are also very, very active. You probably have heard about the work done here in Liège about uh, looking at four exoplanets and the discovery of the Trappist system. So this is an area we're still pursuing. And this goes back to a long tradition of astronomy in our university. We also have a very important research center doing uh, more applied research, building instruments and testing instruments and satellites and having you know, all the specialized equipment to do this. Now, coming to this project, I, I think this is really a very exciting project because first, of course, as the previous speaker just mentioned, we are in the context of international collaboration in our region, which I think is really very important in this modern world. Second, we are really in what science is all about, starting with theory, which was developed you know, more a century ago, a little bit less, and then going to finally instruments and then to who knows what, because of course with these instruments we're going to learn about our universe, but there might be all sorts of other uh, fallout of this work. As if you look at history, when we started looking, you know, further away in the universe with just optical instruments, this led to all sorts of developments which were not linked to the initial uh, goal of looking at the universe. And I think probably similar things will happen here because when you're developing very advanced instruments, very advanced technology, so quite often a lot of applications come out of this, which are absolutely not expected. Very different things from what you were looking for. Of course, you'll find things in the area you're looking at, but you also find things in other areas, which is also very, very good, bringing a lot of very interesting opportunities. So what's important in a context like that is to be ready to seize opportunities. And I think, you know, universities are often presented as institutions which are a little bit conservative. And I think what is emerging now from universities is, is that they're not at all conservative. They dare to do new things. They dare to go in new directions. And this is really what we need in this world to move forward and just go out of the usual path because we are faced with a lot of problems and it is by doing this that we'll be able to go forward and solve a lot of these problems. So I'll just end by wishing you a very productive meeting. And I think we have a good chance of, you know, having this ancient telescope here in our region. And my sincere wish is that in some years, I don't know exactly how many, we'll be able to meet again to talk about the first observations made with the Einstein uh, telescope. Have a very good meeting. Okay, thank you very much. And now uh, I will go on uh, with the presentation. I ask all of you to take your mobile phone for the first part of, the, of this presentation and, uh, and to connect to this link because we will just we will just start with a small survey. Okay, I think we can go. So the first question is, which country are you from? We would like to see if there is a good uh, representation of all of you as it is in the project. Hey, come on. <laughs> yeah, of course, in Belgium, we have the Flemish partners and the Walloon partners. But okay, this is quite a good, uh, a good participation. Then I wanted to know who are you? I mean, are you a company? Are you an academic? Are you a cluster of SMEs or a business development agency? Or are you part of our local regional authority? 
are you somebody from the society, from the public? So there are many, many academics, local and regional uh, authority, companies. Yeah, there are all of them. <laughs> and then the last question is e-test. What do you expect? In one word, I mean, what do you expect from this meeting, from this project, from ETS in general? Ah, you expect fun, progress, research, partnership, science. Whoa, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. This is becoming <laughs> difficult to read. <laughs> we will take a sprint, uh, print screen of uh, all this word, huh, Julien, when it's, it's readable collaboration, research, science, business, breakthrough. That's great. Bohol, text, stress. Who is stressed? <laughs> <laughs> Challenge, tunnel, engineering design. Yeah, you see, it inspires you a lot of things and you expect a lot of things from this project. And I really hope that during uh, this presentation, we will answer all this ambition. Yeah. Okay. We see the, the average of it. Okay, great. You see many, many questions, many expectations. And uh, I won't answer all of them. I will let all this task to uh, Professor Dr. Engineer Christophe Collette, who is the director of the Precision Mechatronic Laboratory at the University of Liège, and who is also our ETEST scientific lead partner for the prototype site. And I hope he will really answer to this question. Why do we need an Einstein telescope, Christophe? Thank you, uh, thank you, Nick. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so this uh, E-Test project, E-Test is standing for Einstein Telescope uh, EMR Site and Technology. So I thought it was an idea to to start with some some words about uh, what uh, is this E-Test, what is Einstein Telescope. It's a gravitational wave. Uh, detector. So uh, what are these gravitational waves? So the, start, the story started about a, a century, a bit more than a century ago, with the general, uh, uh, the theory of general relativity of Einstein, who predicted the existence of this uh, fluctuation of space and time uh, when two uh, super massive black holes are merging uh, each other. But these uh, waves, these gravitational waves, are uh, to give you some flavor about the, the, the size of these waves. Uh, they are generating a fluctuation of the distance between two objects separated by about one kilometer apart uh, with the order of 10 to the minus 18 meters. So it's 0 0.1701 meter. So it's super tiny. And maybe at that time, Einstein was not at all imagining that uh, one day we would be capable to make this detection. But so the, uh, the technology, uh, I mean, developed quite rapidly over the past, say, hal past uh, half a century with the uh, construction of, of several observatories. So I, you see here on the slide, a couple of examples. So LIGO is one uh, interferometer, which is in the US, another one in Italy. There is GEO 600. Uh, in, the, in, in Germany. And with these observatories, so the technology uh, developed until a point where we were capable to reach a sufficient sensitivity for making these detections. So better than words, I'm going to show you uh, a kind of a reconstruction of the first event that was measured uh, about uh, five years ago. So these two black holes, as I was explaining, are, are represented by uh, this little black circle. And so when they are approaching each other, they start, they, there is a kind of inspiration phase starting. 
Oh yeah, it's working. Okay, right, perfect. So, and and they are uh, creating these waves, which are then further going to propagate everywhere in the universe. And so, when these waves are reaching Earth, then the the they are going to to uh, to induce some some deformation everywhere on Earth. So, uh, on the animation, you see how the Earth is being deformed, of course, with a lot of exaggeration. But this is just to, to I mean, for, for the uh, visual uh, of, of the, the, the okay, the, to, to see it more visually. And so these waves are then uh, passing through the interferometer, this big interferometer. And with the, the fluctuation of the length of these, these two arms, they are creating a signal which are then being detected by this, uh, this uh, huge interferometer. So uh, being convinced about this uh, wonderful uh, opportunity and source of information uh, about of this instrument. So we are now preparing the future with new instrument and more in particular with this Einstein telescope. So uh, this Einstein telescope uh, will have a, a shape of a triangle located uh, deep under the surface of the of the earth so as you have seen these uh, deformation are propagating everywhere so it's 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 also a good idea to locate it uh, deep underground for being less sensitive to the different source of disturb of disturbance that we have at the surface of the earth so uh, the, the this slide is showing us a schematic representation of what the ET will look like. So we are talking about a project uh, or an instrument of about a bit less than 2 uh, billion euro. Uh, it's, it will have a shape of a triangle with the, each uh, arm will have a, a length of about 10 kilometers. Uh, very rapidly here, a couple of uh, characteristics and figure about this Einstein telescope. So it's, it will be uh, a bit more than 10 times more sensitive than current instrument, meaning that we can uh, say observe a much bigger volume of the universe and make much, much more detection than what we are currently capable to make. So I'm not going through all the details of that. But clearly, there is a there is a big science case for this uh, Einstein telescope, with no other uh, uh, say example in elsewhere in the in, in the world. So this is for science case, but there is also a huge uh, promise of the Einstein telescope in terms of economical and impact and so, so impact for society. So we are talking about a large number of job created. We are talking about, of course, a lot of uh, collaboration with industry. And all these things have been uh, reported in two recent uh, economical impact studies, one from Technopolis, another one from Sid Socran, uh, reporting all these stuff in detail. So uh, of course, we can give uh, those who are interested a lot of, of details about that. Um, <clears throat> I, I have one more slide here about uh, well about the context of, of e-test. So this e-test project is an Interreg EMR project, and it is also joining uh, another project, ET Pathfinder, uh, started also very recently. And so this this is also an, an Interreg uh, project with the ambition to create a kind of mini uh, Einstein telescope. So it's a full interferometer, but at a smaller scale. So, and, and in this e-test project, we have uh, two ambitions. So the first one is to develop a model of the underground and uh, to make some uh, measurement and, and, and uh, develop an observatory underground, but also to develop a, a prototype of one part of the instrument, but at full scale. Uh, so, uh, th these two projects are obviously very much uh, uh, complementary, and they are also demonstrating the ambition of this part of the, of Europe to really invest in this uh, in, in Einstein telescope, uh, being fully aware of the impact that such an instrument will have for the for the region. So where where is the I mean where are we for the moment in the in the ET uh, timeline? So we have just. Uh, now uh, submitted the S3 application. So we need to have this instrument uh, 
uh, being uh, listed on this on the roadmap of the of S3 for uh, uh, hoping that one day this uh, Einstein telescope will become a reality. And then uh, after, uh, so we'll we will have the de decision next year. And uh, the, the decision for the site is going to be in, uh, in a couple of years later, about 2025. And after that, uh, we will see uh, the, the preparation of the construction uh, starting with the first of the observation about uh, 10 years later. So we hope to have the first de detection in uh, about uh, 2035 or, or so. So this is it for the very, I mean, very rapidly, the, the, the picture of the context and uh, of, the, of this Einstein telescope and the S3 uh, project. Yeah, so now I'm gonna give the floor to Anik for explaining uh, more in details the, the, the Einstein, uh, the E-test e project. Yeah, if I can just add. <laughs> One thing to this uh, to this slide here is what you see that uh, to take the decision, we will have then the result of ET Pathfinder who started in 2019, of the E-Test project who started in 2020, and maybe of another project in submission. And the result of these three projects, ending all of them end of 2023, will be pulled and will, will be used for the final decision of the final site. So the timing in, in where we are is extremely important and is integrated in this big timeline. So now I will present to you, but really in a nutshell from my side, because I'm not a scientist in here. So our E-Test project and E-Test stands for Einstein Telescope, Eurasia Mesrine Site and Technology. This project started effectively on the 1st of February of this year and uh, will end uh, mid-2023 uh, and has a budget of 15 million euro. So I'm Anik Pirard, I'm senior manager for the Interreg project at the Interface Entreprise University of Liège in Belgium. And I'm also the E-Test project coordination, but not at the scientific point of view, at the more general point of view. So now you understood it. E-Test is really a project that is a proof of concept of both the prototype site and the geological site of the Einstein telescope. We will build a prototype that will be localized at the CSL uh, in Liège. And we will also run all the underground study uh, in, in the uh, uh, region uh, at the border of the Eurasia Mersrine. And uh, this will really allow to, to define the optimal design and location of the future Einstein telescope. So I wanted to to explain it in a nutshell. And you know, everything has a start. At the E-Test Adventure started for me a rainy day of October, 2018. It was October 30 at 11.15. Christophe Colette entered my room for the first time. <laughs> and he said, hey, I'm Christophe. I have a fabulous project. We can do a proof of concept of the Einstein telescope and this will give us information about the Big Bang and the creation of the universe. And one day you will see I will build an Einstein telescope on the moon if you want. But please, Anik, help me because the Interreg application form and the EMS platform, it's just like a black hole for me. And okay, he was there, I was here. Two words collided and uh, here we are. <laughs> Then it went very, very fast. First submission in January, second in June, official uh, uh, agreement, uh, official grant letter in February. We started, we started really so happy and then stuck by this uh, coronavirus crisis, but we didn't lose our enthusiasm. And I wanted to just explain the consortium structure of our project. You see that this project is led by the University of Liège. 
we at Interface, we do the general coordination and we also do the general communication with a big, big investment of NMWP, our German colleague. And at the University of Liège, we have also the involvement of four different uh, departments. So the PML, UE, Géorve, and CSL of Liège. They are the scientific lead partner of the project. This project is divided in four parts. It's called for work package. And uh, we made this, uh, two of them are dedicated to the prototype and the last two one to the geology side. And you will see that for each working package, we give the head to one of our U regional partners. So this project, this consortium is really U regional and really uh, collaborating in that way. You will see that each, the NICEF is heading the first working package, Fraunhofer ELT, the second one, uh, Julia Geology, the third one, and RWTA Aachen, the fourth one. And this will be the four presentation you will be able to listen just in a few minutes. In this project, we are really planning to build an, an Einstein Telescope Industrial Advisory Board. It will be led by the project partners and the participants uh, we, are, uh, we are willing to have are the SMEs or other companies, big companies, business development agencies, sectorial agencies, you know, the clusters of competitiveness and also local regional authorities that are really welcome to participate. This is just to show you our Gantt chart because we started in February, we had unfortunately six months of stop and then we have six extra months. So we still have three years after this time to finish all our deliverables and activity. And I wanted to show you the context of uh, e-test. First, ET Pathfinder project started in 2019, a few months before e-test. In e-test, you have this prototype uh, working group and the geology working group. Uh, in the organization of e-test, we have a COMAC every year the, at the COMAC, the antenna, the interreg antennas and uh, the, the representative of the region are participating. They are following us. They are a COMAC, it's a comité d'accompagnement. They are helping us, guiding us and following our development, uh, not to have uh, all the result only at the end of the project. Then we want to build an Einstein Telescope Industrial Advisory Board. ET Pathfinder organized the first one last year, but what we want to do is organize a common one. So a common industrial advisory board of both projects, because in fact, we are really looking for the same companies. And, and I, I put it uh, lightly, don't forget there is another project in submission that is also extremely linked to this industrial advisory board. So, for the next, for the coming months, uh, we are today, the 9th of October, with our kickoff. I will invite all of you uh, in December, I will have to set a date for the first Einstein Telescope Industrial Advisory Board meeting. Until then, we will also do all the follow up of the procurement pr procedure because, in this project, in this case, this is extremely important. We have a lot of them because we are buying very big, big equipment. And they will be published on our e-test website. So all the company will be able to see it. So it, it's published via the usual channel, but also on the website. We will also publish the link to the online catalog of Einstein Telescope Technology. This is a kind of summary of the specification we need to build the Einstein telescope. We will make it very easy and readable. And so it will be an, an extremely important tool for the companies to see how they can collaborate with us in which uh, field they are fitting or not. And our next COMAC with um, Interreg Antenna and regional representative is already planned in May, 2021. For the communication, uh, we are mainly using the website. The website is online since the month of May. 
And uh, you will see that, and I will show you because it's important to see where you can find the information. You will see that there is an online form to allow the SME to contact us and participate to the industrial advisory board. We will update it with all the procurements, the activity, the online catalog of ET technology, the new, the press, press release, everything will be updated. We will communicate, we will have a specific way of communication to the company because it will be through this uh, advisory board or it, it will be through meetings. It will be through big <coughs> events if we are allowed to participate due to the sanitary situation. But we will also have a campaign of communication to the society, to the, you know, the commune, to the, the places, because there will be a lot of geological studies and drilling sites, and everybody should be well informed and, uh, yeah, have the opportunity to ask their question and their fear. So we will also communicate via LinkedIn, Twitter, and maybe Facebook also for the society. <coughs> We will organize our own events and we have planned four specific workshops dedicated to companies. It is planned, it is not uh, in the agenda yet, but they will come in 2021. Then I just wanted to, uh, to, to just to show, show you our website. This is the website. Have you been on the website already? Don't hesitate, you will find co already quite a lot of information. You see, the, you have this landing page. Then you can already see the activities. This page will really be updated with uh, all the activity that the researcher will do to, uh, to, to give as much information as possible. For the, for the company, I really advise you to go on this page. This is where the ET technologies will be uh, detailed. And you can already see all the fields of technology that are required. And if you are interested, please register on this, with this form on the website. Then you have an explanation of the ecosystem because you know we are several projects. We also have all the news. And I really invite you to go and see the news because you will already see that uh, our next event is in October 29, and it's organized by NMWP with Professor Akim Stahl. So you even have a way to register in here. You have also all the publication and press release. And I, you can see that 2020 is really our year because the Nobel Prize in Physics has also been given for the discovery that the black hole formation in a robust prediction for the general theory of relativity. So. This is our year. Then you also, if you need to contact us, everything is extremely transparent on this website. Each partner is uh, indicated and each scientist can be reached. We have named all the scientists and all the communication relation person. So you can really contact us. So the website is a very useful tool. Let's, we will let's stop with all this blah, blah, and now we will start talking serious with the first ETES working package, ultra cold vibration control. There is an approximative budget of 4 million euro for this, uh, this working package. And the presentation will be done by Dr. Alessandro Bertolini, staff researchers researcher in gravitational wave instrumentation at the NICEF. So the NICEF is the National Institute for Subatomic Physics in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And Alessandro will talk about the first working package and the different activities that are planned in this, pack in this working package. So Alessandro, are you with me? Hi, good morning. Thank you for the introduction, Nick. So good morning, everyone. I will uh, uh, briefly introduce uh, what we, we will be working on. Uh, we are already working on uh, about uh, work package one. So uh, the Einstein telescope uh, will, uh, will open uh, uh, very uh, new horizons uh, in gravitational waves uh, and in general in astrophysics. Uh, because it will allow us to, uh, leap to, to, to uh, look much deeper in the universe. If you, if you look at this, uh, time, uh, this, uh, this uh, sketch, 
compared to the uh, existing detectors LIGO and Virgo. With the Einstein telescope, we will be able to look uh, very far uh, from us in the universe at very large red shifts of, if you, uh, if, if you wish, very far back on time uh, till uh, the, the Big Bang. We won't be looking at, but listening as, uh, as the gravitational waves allow us in the in the core in uh, down to the uh, uh, the dark ages of the universe right after the big bang when stars were not formed yet so this is a is really a unique uh, uh, opportunity so one distinctive feature of the Einstein telescope is that uh, this device will allow us to extend the gravitational wave observation band down to 3 hertz uh, compared to the 10 Hz of the prison detector. This seems simple, but actually is extremely uh, challenging from the, the, the point of view of technology. Uh, in particular, if you look at where we are now, so uh, now the detector, the existing detector are, uh, are in this blue region of the, of the plot. We want to go to the green one with the Einstein telescope. In particular, you see that there is a huge gap to be uh, bridged, especially in the low frequency range. For this, uh, to do that, we need to do, uh, we plan to do two things. The first one, we need to reduce the impact of uh, environmental vibration uh, going and with building the Einstein telescope deep underground. And uh, we need to improve also the vibration isolation systems that, are, uh, that we are using now. Then we have to do another thing. At, in the, in the mid-range frequencies, so say from, uh, from 10 hertz to a few hundred, we have to do another thing. We need to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, lower the, the noise, uh, uh, it, that is caused by the, the thermal fluctuation of the mirrors uh, and uh, their suspension system. For this reason, we will, the idea is to make very large mirrors and cool them to low, uh, low temperature. So, uh, in, in this work package, we are trying to tackle uh, engineering aspects that will be uh, uh, that will be crucial for the Einstein telescope. So the first one, we need to improve vibration isolation in the low frequency range. So from 0.01 Hertz to 10 Hertz, we will do that testing novel uh, attenuation schemes based on combination of uh, active and passive isolation systems, uh, technologies, and uh, uh, we need to develop uh, inertial sensors in order to be able to do that that are going beyond the state of the art. Then we have to do the other thing, which is very important. Uh, we need to cool this, uh, to, to show that we can cool such a large uh, optics below 20 Kelvin uh, without uh, spoiling the performance of the detector itself. That is very, is very tricky. So we will be investigating strategies uh, uh, both for the initial cooldown and for the steady state operation of a mirror of such a dimension. And we will be devising solution for the mechanical interface between the cryostat and the mirror suspension. That is extremely challenging from the technological point of view. To do that, we will be, as Christophe mentioned, uh, just by building a full scale prototype of, uh, of the suspension and uh, of the environment, I, I would say, of a large uh, silicon optics al as it will be in the Einstein telescope. So uh, what we will have, uh, we will have a, a full scale mirror suspension and with its steering mechanics, a cryostat built around it and, uh, and the mirror suspension steering mechanics will be hanging from a, a, an advanced, I would say seismic isolation system on which we will, uh, we will test all these new technologies and techniques. So, so far where we are. Uh, so the first thing we have uh, uh, decided for the imp em experimental infrastructure. So uh, 
the, the Sun Spatial de Liege offer, uh, or I would say made available, uh, a very large vacuum chamber uh, they have is, uh, is the Focal 6.5 vacuum chamber. It is a test setup that they have permanently at, at CSL. 6.5 means 6.5 meter diameter. Is a is a kind of lab in which you can walk in and uh, and 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 the facility and build large uh, large mechanical systems inside. The facility is already equipped with uh, with uh, helium liquefier, so we'll be able to cool down the thermal tent uh, uh, and uh, and further in in uh, in a thermal shield down to four Kelvin. Uh, so the 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 test prototype will be built inside this this uh, system. So then, uh, uh, then we started looking at we are in the design phase now uh, at the architecture of the mirror cooling system. So uh, the, the first thing that we have done we have uh, uh, designed uh, 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 we made a, a conceptual design of the payload. The payload means anything that is inside the cryostat. So we dimension uh, a possible uh, uh, ET suspension system. You see the silicon mirror and the other intermediate uh, intermediate stage for for the steering, uh, and uh, and we did also a preliminary material selection. In this way, we can inform uh, uh, the thermal uh, design of the of the cooling system and the system architecture uh, itself. Right now. Uh, uh, we are looking at, uh, uh, at at a different, I would say, not standard architecture that has been proposed by the CSL engineers, in which uh, uh, we will uh, uh, we will try to uh, to eliminate any uh, any direct mechanical link between the the suspended uh, uh, the suspended payload and the, and the cryostat. Uh, the idea is to, uh, to, to try to demonstrate or, or, or to check if it's possible to cool the mirror down to 20 Kelvin just by thermal, uh, uh, just by, uh, by, by heat radiation transfer. Uh, this, of course, would have a, an enormous benefit in terms of spurious vibration introduced in the system. And right now, there are ongoing thermal simulations. Uh, to evaluate if this is possible. Uh, so then, uh, uh, then we are in parallel. The other group, the other group uh, is uh, is investigating uh, which architecture uh, would be the the optimal one uh, for the vibration isolation system. So we did a lot of. Uh, uh, of, of, of uh, simulation and, uh, uh, and 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 modeling uh, to uh, to to down select uh, different design options. Uh, of course, we did uh, with modeling of mechanical response of of, of, um, of systems and uh, a, both in open and closed loop, assuming uh, uh, an input seismic noise that we expect from the EMR region. Uh, at the part of the ground location. Uh, at the end, uh, we, we select these two, uh, 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 these two alternative configuration that will undergo uh, more complex simulation. Uh, basically, uh, in, the, in, in the right side, you see uh, uh, a, a complex system in which we combine uh, a, a double stage uh, six degrees of freedom active isolation platform with a more standard, more traditional ultra low natural frequency inverted pendulum system used in Virgo, in the Virgo detector. On the other, on, on, on the left side, this is a, is, is, a, is a different system in which the inverted pendulum is replaced by a rigid frame. Uh, so we will uh, go ahead with, with simulation uh, with the goal of, uh, of, uh, of then go to uh, uh, engineering design. So uh, very important for the uh, active isolation stages are the inertial sensors. 
at the University of Liège, there is uh, uh, undergoing uh, 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 a development of inertial sensors, uh, both horizontal and vertical, uh, the design of, of which is, is based on negative stiffness uh, mechanism that are applied to reduce the natural frequency of the instrument and then to boost their, their resolution. So, so far, uh, uh, 100 millihertz natural frequency in horizontal and 250 millihertz in vertical have been achieved. The sensors are equipped with laser interferometer for ultra high precision measurement of the proof mass displacement. And these devices have already demonstrated on, on prototype uh, lab uh, scale sensitivity to inertial motion at picometer level over 10, 100 second time scale. Uh, this number uh, already outperform all the state of the art commercial sensors. Then we are looking to something even more, uh, more uh, 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 say, unusual. So, so we want to also instrument the prototype with uh, inertial sensors in the cry inside the cryogenic environment itself. Uh, so at UC Louvain, uh, there is a development ongoing in which we want to uh, develop an uh, ultra-sensitive uh, uh, accelerometer that will be sitting on the, on the, on the, top, uh, uh, the top stage of the cryogenic uh, payload to uh, measure the residual motion of the, of, of the stage itself, so for, for diagnostic reasons but also we could try to, uh, to, to use it for, uh, to, uh, to use it in, in the control system or the payload itself. On, on the right side, uh, uh, Leven is, uh, is developing a dedicated MEMS accelerometer that will be using the cryogenic CMOS signal conditioner. Uh, this is completely new, uh, new also for the field uh, of gravitational wave. That would be very interesting uh, because with these very small sensors, we could, uh, we could uh, map very easily the vibrations of the, of, the credit, of the cooling system, of the heat shields in particular. And uh, uh, possibly if, the, if at the end we had to use a, a, a mechanical link between the cryostat and the, and the payload, uh, we could uh, use this sensor to make uh, uh, an active vibration isolator to reduce the, the motion of the heat link itself. Uh, then uh, what we are, we are doing, uh, this is happening in Aachen, uh, uh, we want, of course, we cannot wait uh, wait we build the, the giant cryostat to do test of materials and test of, uh, of sensors, actuators. Uh, so what we did, uh, we are now, uh, now preparing uh, a fast turnaround cryogenic test setup in which we can do all this kind of test. Uh, this has been designed by Aachen. Uh, this, this, uh, this test facility will, will be able to reach 10K temperature with an ultra high vacuum down to 10 minus 9 millibar and will be equipped with a, with a pulse tube cryo cooler for low vibration and the and that will allow us to, to have a very short cooling time and low running cost. This device has been already uh, ordered and the delivery uh, is expected by mid-November. So this is where we are. Uh, in the coming months, this is what we are going to do. Uh, so first of all, uh, we are progressing, uh, organizing at the moment, uh, the prototype system engineering. You know, this is very important. Then we will have to produce the executive design for the modification needed uh, on, the, on the focal 6.5 vacuum chamber to host the prototype. Uh, then on the cryogenic side, we will complete the design study, including payload thermal model, heat transfer, and cool down time studies. And we will select the architecture. So we will decide whether we, we can go with the, with, the thermal, with the thermal radiation cooling or, or we have to do the more standard uh, heat link uh, uh, scheme. And we have to progress uh, to the uh, engineering design of the cryostat itself. On the, on the vibration isolation side, 
we will complete the design study and uh, and we will come up with the with a decision with about the architecture of the vibration isolator and we will uh, select sensor actuator for the active isolation stages and we will start uh, the engineering design of the system on the on the on the inertial sensor for low temperature uh, the goal is to have a, a, a technical design of the of prototypes and start their production for testing thank you very much thank you very much alessandro for this uh, great presentation it's my pleasure to welcome the second speaker so he will present the wpt2 optical <laughs> engineering uh, this working package has a budget of about uh, 3 million euro and I have the pleasure to welcome Dr. Oliver Fitzau, Group Manager Fiber Lasers of the Fraunhofer Institute for Laser Technology, so ELT, in Aachen, Germany. And uh, Oliver will present us the activity of the second working package. Yeah, good morning from my side. So I'm going to present the uh, work package number two, which is all about um, optical engineering. So uh, Annie, please, if you could switch to the next slide. So the very brief agenda, uh, I'm going to give a very short introduction into the work package, uh, showing you the structure and, and uh, what the, the main uh, goals are. And then I want to present uh, the single uh, working points that we, we have and also finish with uh, what we are currently doing. Um, so the overall goal of the um, of the Einstein telescope, as you have heard from uh, from Alessandro and, and Christoph already, is to uh, establish a very highly precise uh, gravitational wave detection interferometer. And one of the features of the Einstein telescope is that we uh, want to use uh, an additional wavelength at uh, two micrometers, which is um, which is um, which will allow us to uh, further reduce noise coming from optical coatings and um, and in, in and thereby in improving the accuracy of the um, of the interferometer and also the hopefully the resolution for the measurements. So um, in principle, the work is divided in three uh, sub work packages, which uh, is first the large silicon uh, mirror manufacture and test then uh, the part about uh, the laser development and the optical components uh, at, at 2 micron and finally we want to assemble the subsystems and validate the functions so yeah i, I um, the the structure of the work package is um, yeah in principle so we have the two larger uh, sections which is the large mirror and uh, they are the teams from the uh, CSL in Liège are working uh, together with the University in Leuven. And then we have the lasers and sensors. So um, the Fraunhofer ILT is uh, uh, responsible for laser development and the University of Hasselt is working on uh, improving sensor technology. And uh, on top of it all, we have the University in Maastricht uh, overlooking it all, uh, making sure that all the the goals are in, in uh, are synchronized to each other, so that we have a nice uh, outcome of the um, of the project, and also everything uh, should work together. Yeah. So uh, the first uh, topic I would like to present is the silicon mirror manufacturing, which is basically uh, the responsibility of the university in Liège. So. Um, as, as Alessandro already said, uh, so we are using uh, silicon mirrors uh, in, in this project, which uh, should improve uh, mechanical and also the noise properties because we can use them in uh, cryogenic setups to reduce Brownian motion. And also they are very massive in order to reduce the vibrations or the disturbances coming from uh, radiation pressure. Uh, and but to to make this uh, possible, a lot of improvements for the manufacturing of these large mirrors is is um, is necessary. And one of the key uh, features or, or, or um, activities to to achieve this uh, is to to make sure that we can characterize these mirrors um, with high precision. And um, um, if you can switch to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, that's uh, uh, one of the largest. Uh, topics that uh, CSL is working on at the moment. So in principle, due to temperature variations, 
and also vibrational excitation, the shape of the mirror can change on a very uh, small uh, uh, scale. And uh, what we are trying to do here is, um, is set up an, uh, a white light interferometer in principle uh, that allows us to, to monitor the shape of the surface of the mirror with sub nanometer precision. And the goal is to uh, achieve um, interferometry of large fields of view because the, the, um, the mirrors are very, uh, very large. And also to, um, to uh, allow an online uh, monitoring of, of the system. So, um, and, and, and have a look at the, at the dynamic uh, behavior. Um, so that's that's the, what what we are doing uh, in terms of the manufacturing, and also the second thing we are doing with the mirrors is uh, the the coating. Anik, please, uh, if you could switch to the next slide. So the next topic would be um, the coating of the silicon mirrors. So one of the largest uh, contributors to the mirror noise is the uh, coating material. So we have always some, um, if, if we shoot a laser onto an optical coating, we always deposit some of the power in the coating. So this leads to a creation of heat. And then this leads to, um, to an increase in the noise of the mirror. And um, what the colleagues in Leuven are working on is, um, if you can go to the next slide, please, um, is yeah, so the state of the art in, in, uh, in mirror coating is usually um, using silicone and uh, tantal oxide coatings. Um, but but with, this, um, with this technology, we are a bit limited and we create some noise. Um, and, and in our activity, we are uh, planning to use a single crystal, crystal oxide mirror coatings, which uh, which should reduce the noise significantly because we do not um, we do not exhibit such high um, yeah um, absorption in the coatings, and um, also have a very uniform uniform coating. So um, what the e test really is is about is exploring the noise performance of different material classes for these coatings, and um, also the technologies for transferring the, 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 the coatings or the single layers to the mirror are also being investigated. And um, yeah, so this, this should lead to a, a, a very a great improvement for this uh, coating technology. Um, yeah, so um, in terms of the laser development, that's uh, what, what ILT is doing at the moment. Uh, so yeah, um, there are some some high demands also on the on the beam source itself. So of course, um, the the complete goal of all that we do in the Einstein uh, project is reduce noise or or any kind of signal disturbances coming from the setup itself, because we want to measure only the the uh, deviations coming from uh, um, um, from the yeah from the gravitational waves. Um, so we also need to make sure that the that the laser delivers a very stable output, and as it's a interferometric setup, we need stable output not only in the power, but also in the frequency. Um, so and also because it's uh, uh, we need a, a great coherence, so we need a very narrow line width of the fiber uh, of the laser, and um, yeah, as I said, the emission should be around uh, two micrometers of wavelength, and um, so um, our our basic uh, basic laser design uh, that we are working on is a, a, a two-stage or multi-stage setup with a crystal-based uh, seed source, which will define the spectral properties of the of the output, and then we want to scale the output power using a fiber amplifier or fiber amplifiers. Um, uh, for it to 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 achieving uh, something in in this first in this first uh, stage of the project something between five and ten watts of output power, and by using this two stage setup, it's uh, we have the the benefit of decoupling the actuators for frequency and power, so we can almost independently stabilize power and wavelength um, without uh, interaction between both properties. Um, yeah. Anik, please. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, what we are working on at the moment. Is we we are developing a solid state uh, seed laser source for around two micron, um, based on a, a, a ring laser design. 
which which we have already uh, uh, some experience with uh, at ILT, and also we we are uh, using our former experience from from other projects to develop a fiber amplifier design that allows stable operation and um, also power scaling up to 10 watts of um, of output power and also we are, we will take care of um, the the stabilization in in output power and and frequency um, yeah last but not least the sensor development is also very important uh, key technology uh, sensors are used in principle to measure the uh, output powers in the interferometric in the interferometric setup itself but also uh, cha to to change uh, to to um to to measure changes coming from ambient condition changes or noise from the beam sources um and uh, uh, additionally um by by squeezing the light which is a method to um to either narrow down the fluctuations in in the uh, amplitude or in the phase we can further increase um, the signal to noise ratio so the accuracy um, of the of the interferometer interferometer and therefore in order to do that the colleagues in Hasselt are at the moment currently investigating um, Anik if you could switch please Ah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so in principle, the uh, the work with an e-test uh, in in Hasselt um, includes investigating different um, detector materials, um, judging their spectral dependence, the quantum efficiency, of course, and the noise performance, um, which is always the, the, one of the most important uh, key features, and also. Um, to optimize the readout protocols for these uh, for these um, sensors, um, and of course uh, synchronizing it with the wavelengths that we are producing at ILT from the laser source, because uh, it's uh, the 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 performance of the of the uh, of the detectors can uh, largely vary with the with the wavelength that you expose it to. And furthermore, the colleagues in Hasselt, uh, sorry, Annie, could you go back? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, furthermore, we are also, uh, on, the colleagues in Hasselt are also um, investigating a, a scheme for squeezing the light at two microns, uh, something very similar to what you can see on the right hand side. I, I will not go into the details of it, but it's, um, yeah. So, uh, which is also, um, used to increase the or decrease the noise within the the whole system um, yeah so now please to the next slide um, yeah so the current work that we are doing um, to to round up the talk is um, yeah for the silicon test mass or the, the um, we are working on the design of the suspension stages and the the work on the uh, white light interferometer for surface characterization is going on and for the coatings the different technologies and, and coating options and materials are, are being assessed at the moment in terms of their uh, performance. And uh, for, the, for the laser and the, the sensor development, yes, please go uh, if you can. Thank you. Um, the, yeah, so at the moment at ILT, we have established a baseline for the, for the um, for the laser setup, I, now we are working on the details and starting procurement of components to, to start first um, um, lab uh, work. And for the detectors, the, the different um, options for materials have been reviewed. And at the moment, um, the optical table is being installed uh, at, the, at the labs in Hasselt and also the design for the um, for the for characterization of the detectors is is going on yeah so that's a very brief uh, overview of what we are doing uh, in work package two um yeah so thank you very much for your attention thank you very much oliver thank you uh i will now go to the to the next speaker and don't be surprised we will uh directly go to the WPT4 EMR geological modeling and engineering geology of the Einstein telescope with a quite big budget of five million and a half euro. And this will be presented by Professor Dr. Florian Amann, 
Chair of Engineering, Geology and Hydrogeology at the RWTH Aachen. Uh, he will present the, the main activity of the WPT4. And Florian, do you want to do the presentation yourself? Yes, I can do this. Good so, morning, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm super happy to present this today in the name of all the partners uh, from the work package uh, number four. I quickly want to give you a short uh, introduction to the main objective. So there's two main objectives of the work package. Uh, one is a 3D cross-border geological model, uh, which uh, requires to evaluate and integrate uh, existing geological data. We work on that, but we also want to integrate in near future new data. These are surface data. These are data coming from new boreholes. So in total, we want to drill five boreholes. And what we also perform in near future is an active and passive seismic survey. I will talk about this a, a couple of slides later. The second big objective is, of course, that we want to contribute to the uh, Einstein telescope design. So we are performing a feasibility study of the underground infrastructure, and we try to help finding the optimal position of the Einstein uh, triangle in the region. Um, I explain a little bit more that this is a, quite a, a tricky business. And this goes along with uh, very intensive in situ and laboratory testing and the assessment of the local geology in terms of uh, tunnel engineering. So this includes fracture characteristics and outcrop analog uh, studies. So in order to find a uh, suitable location for the Einstein telescope, we need to understand the boundary conditions and starting from the surface, you have heard it from the other speakers, there's infrastructure, there's roads, there's railways, and there's windmills, and they emanate noise. And the emanate noise propagates also into the underground. And uh, therefore, this is a main driver to go into the underground with the Einstein telescope to uh, get rid of most of the noise which is produced at the surface. And in the area of the Einstein telescope, we are in a very good situation because uh, at the top and the upper layer of the geology, we have mostly soft rocks and they have uh, the, they are capable to very effectively damp this ambient noise so that we don't be, uh, perturb uh, the Einstein telescope infrastructure. And when we go deeper, and I switch on quickly my laser pointer, so if we go deeper into the underground, we expect to reach hard rocks and these hard rocks are very uh, favorable to host larger infrastructure coverings, providing that we stay away from larger fault zones and also karst formation, as you can see on the right hand side picture. Um, one of the work package for uh, task uh, is to establish a cross border database, and this database uh, contains a, a variety of relevant information to find the optimal site. What you can see here on the right hand side is, is, uh, is uh, Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany. And this is a geological map from surface. It's a surface map information we could collect on the surface or which are already existing. And uh, this gives us a very nice overview of what kind of rock we have to expect on the surface, but also gives us some ideas what we have to expect in the deeper underground. And you see on these lines here, we also get a very useful information uh, on um, existing um, geological fault zones. This is only on the, on the surface, and I cannot skip my slide because of whatever reason. Um, sorry for that. I everything uh, that here for the moment. Ah, no, sorry. Now I have it. Uh, of course, we also need information about the subsurface, and what you can see here on the right hand side. And I turn on my laser pointer again. You see a lot of dots here in Germany, in, in Netherlands, and in, in Belgium. And these dots represent boreholes, which are deeper than 20 meters. And they provide us with a lot of uh, important information. Like here, you see on the tiered seat, tiered seat uh, drill hole, we, we, we see the entire lithological profile. We get information, additional information on fault zones. And to some extent, we also learn something about the hydrogeological. Um, um, situation in the deeper underground. Despite this data, there's other data which are equally important. What you can see here on the right hand side is a map which shows the land use of the region. So there's different colors and I want to explain a couple of them as an example. So for example, the greenish colors here that represent areas where we have Natura 2000. Of course, uh, the access to the infrastructure in the underground should not be in this area. And then we have other um, 
um, areas here, as you see, this is uh, industrial or urban areas. We don't want to have uh, subsurface installation below uh, these areas, but also there's a lot of infrastructure existing. So this is a highway, for example, and this infrastructure which existing could be extremely useful and valuable for the construction of the infrastructure of the Einstein telescope. Um, as you had, have heard already from other speakers and was mentioned before, this infrastructure is emanating noise and this noise can be a perturbation for the gravitational wave detector. So what we have to look at, which of the infrastructure is producing which kind of noise. And you can see here in yellow, this is a, a, a railway and this is a highway here, here is a windmill. And around this infrastructure, uh, element we have noise which we don't want to have in uh, the perimeter of the Einstein telescope so we have to uh, foresee a buffer around these infrastructure elements in order to find the best location. Uh, since the beginning of the Einstein telescope project in early 2000 we started to investigate the area you can see here on the map the, all these little dots represent what we call an outcrop so the ge geology is visible on the surface like you see on the right hand side picture and we try to characterize this uh, rock mass here in terms of uh, uh, for the purpose of tunneling so we try to understand what kind of behavior of the rock we have to expect when we go into the deep underground and here on the animation you see that we use a variety of methods to get the required information. These outcrops also provide us a, a, a great uh, opportunity to also take already samples so you can here see a, a little uh, drilling device and from this drilling device, we collect the cores of the variety of, of rocks which are relevant for the Einstein telescope. And using this, uh, this uh, course here, we do geomechanical uh, parameter testing in the laboratory. Uh, and these parameters are very important for the tunnel design. And they're also uh, important to estimate the timing of the tunneling. And at the end of the day, of course, they determine uh, the financial uh, or the costs of um, the uh, of the uh, Einstein telescope. What we are doing at the moment, so planned work, so uh, based on this uh, cross-border uh, 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 database we collected, we can identify a, var a variety of different locations where we can drill. So we, in total, we plan for five boreholes, and one of these areas which uh, seems to be a favorable place for drilling is around the area of Cortez. Uh, it's not confirmed yet, but we're working on the permissions to start drilling in this area. What do we learn out of such a drilling? We can learn a lot. We can learn about the depths of the weaker layer in the upper underground. We can learn something, is there karst involved or not involved? We can learn a lot about the faults, uh, about the geo, uh, geotechnical characterization of the rock mass. Is the underground really suitable for a cover and where we have to place this? And last but not least, we can measure the damping of the ambient noise, so we can put seismometers uh, in boreholes, and we can learn how much of the noise is damped and uh, if the location is feasible. Last but not least, uh, we are also planning at the moment an active uh, seismic uh, survey. So you can see here on the map, this is also not confirmed at the moment, but this is the uh, initial idea we have. There is a uh, seismic line, so we have a non-destructive method to image the underground to a certain depth. And we plan for two seismic surveys, which are more or less north-south, and about three seismic surveys, which are east-west. They allow us to identify fault zones and also boundaries between different lithologies. Um, and of course, we want to use existing infrastructure, like these roads here, that we don't have to uh, provide a lot of perturbation to the region, uh, make it as less perturbing as possible. I thank you very much for your attention. I tried to make this in 10 minutes. I hope I reached the goal here. Many thanks, Florian. Many thanks for this presentation. And we will, uh, we will go on with the next speaker who will present uh, the WPT3, so EMR Cross-Border Underground Observatory with a budget of one and a half million. <coughs> and, uh, this working package will be presented by Professor Dr. Engineer Frédéric Nguyen, Chair of Applied Geophysics and Director of Urban 
and environment engineering at the University of Liège in Belgium. Frédéric is also the ETS scientific lead partner for the geology part of the project. And he will talk about the, this activity for the cross-border underground observatory. So uh, Frédéric, I will give you the floor. I think I already have the, the floor. I started sharing my screen, so I hope everybody can, uh, can see it. Uh, so I'm, I'm super glad to be here as well. Uh, uh, I'd like to acknowledge all the partners, which are pretty much the same that Florian actually presented in the previous uh, work package. And of course, those two work packages, three and four, are actually very closely connected. And um, oops, let's see if this works now. So if, if I go over the activities and deliverables that we aim at in this, uh, in this WTU, the three work package, we actually aim for uh, different types of models, which are cross-border in the region. Um, one is dedicated to, to basically groundwater model, another one is dedicated to the seismic noise model, and the last one to the seismic hazard. Uh, in addition to those models, which will help, as you understood from the previous presentation, basically design and, and compute the ET structure, we also uh, will install a, a, a underground monitoring system that we called hydrogeophysical observatory that will basically monitor the subsurface and basically both results are going to be key for the positioning the 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 Sorry. and also for the sustainable management of the of the underground so i hope you can I hope you can hear me. So I will start a little bit, little bit talking about the, the first uh, activities, which are linked to the, the groundwater. And uh, so we might ask ourselves why it's actually worth to study how the hydrogeological conditions. And basically, if you look at any tunneling or, or successful underground project, we know that groundwater is actually a key factor to control uh, for a successful tunneling project. Um, and uh, I hope you can hear me. I'm just going to try to do that better. Uh, and, and so basically groundwater flow will basically be mainly controlled by strata discontinuities, as you can, you can see on the, on, the, on the image. And it's going to be critical to actually control this water inflow close to the, to the, to the Einstein telescope structure, both for the construction phase and exploitation phase. Ta-da. Okay. And it would be also a critical input, as Florian mentioned, for the design of the Einstein telescopes. And we will need basically data at very different scales, ranging basically from, uh, from the borehole scales uh, to basically also the sample scales. And you can see from, from this map, it basically represents uh, pumping wells that are being used to basically uh, pump water from the underground and then use it to distribute it to, to the public. And so by uh, building this cross-border EMR groundwater model, it will enable basically a sustainable management of those natural resources for water abstraction, to look at the potential in terms of shallow geothermy and to look at any studies concerning environmental impact assessment, for example. Um, the seismic noise, as we understood from all the previous talk, is going to be very important for the Einstein telescope itself. And Florian already presented this, so I don't have to uh, say a lot about it. But we basically need to understand how vibration varies in space. And basically, it will depend a lot on the geology and on the positioning of the different sources. So you have, for example, highways, wind turbines, or uh, industrial activities that basically will create vibration ground movements and we basically need to measure them at the surface which is the graph that you see here on the top but also measure them at depth um, and we need to monitor those vibration to understand basically how those vibration transfer from the surface to the subsurface and how they are actually attenuated at the depth considered for the Einstein telescope and be suitable for a good measurements of the of the gravitational waves um, the project will also aim at improving the existing seismic hazard maps and by basically looking at the, the definition of seismic sources, computing site effects. This is an image of an 
of field work that was done in the summer uh, 2020, looking at the resident frequency at one particular site close to, uh, so actually not far from Kotasen, that Florian Manson in, in Bezal, where you see uh, the peak frequency in, in different graph that, that you show here is, is tells you the frequency of the upper layer, which basically resonates and can amplify, for example, earthquake effects. And basically, we also run different scenarios of, of earthquake propagation and to assess basically their impacts on the, uh, the Einstein telescope structure. Uh, we also need to image the subsurface to understand how the seismic wave propagates into it. And this is an example of results that we obtained again this summer. It's a seismic tomography, so it shows you how the seismic velocity varies in space. Here it's at a depth of about uh, something like 60 meter over uh, a length of about 200 meter. Uh, finally, the other derivable of this work package is this uh, hydrogeophysical observatory and monitoring public database. And uh, now I can change my slides. Okay, so this will be. We still need to identify the site, so it's not yet defined, uh, and it will basically need to identify the site to host this underground R&D lab. And the idea here is to install different types of sensors in, in, in boreholes, electrical sensor, hydraulic sensor, seismic sensor, to monitor the subsurface in the EMR region to basically um, twofold, the objectives are twofold, to gather seismic noise data to constrain basically the seismic noise models and also to perform hydrogeophysical tests to basically help calibrating the EMR groundwater models. So basically this R&D lab will be used to monitor the subsurface to basically feed the two models that we want to, that we want to produce. So here's an example of the results that we got in the measurement campaigns. This is uh, somebody from the University of Bonn, actually. You see here the layout of the surface is, is a cable and we basically do a tomography of the subsurface so, so we don't have to drill to gain information on the subsurface. So in this case, the images that you see on the, on the, on, on the right are basically a resistivity image. So it tells you how the rock conducts electricity or not and also how it stores electrical charge to, through the charge or polarizability. And it basically tells us basically where there can be water, where there can be fractures, and this will provide us insights on the geology and also on the underground water. Uh, so this is close to the site of Kottesen. We actually did a bit more details. It also show you a bit the scales that we uh, which would like to work for the uh, observatory. And of course, the imaging scale would be much greater. So this is, if you know the area, this is around the castle of Bezal. And you see two tomography lines that we did at the surface. I only show two, but we did actually did more. And it actually provides us a very nice pictures of the underground. And the red that you see here is actually the hard rock formation. And uh, you can see that we can map, for example, the presence of lateral variation, which could be related to fractured zones, which you, can, you actually see in one of the image, and decide to install, oops, yeah, for example, the uh, underground observatory, which are basically the sensor installed in the ball holes, monitored by a automated data acquisition system at the surface and then linked uh, to our offices directly. So activities are in progress and we thank already the local authorities and population for the support uh, by allowing us to work in the region and in the coming months, as Florian had says, we will discuss site selection for drilling, observatory positioning and discussion on ET corners. Uh, we will also do open seminar and dissemination in the regions because now we have gathered enough data to show around. Uh, the seismic lines are also going to be uh, tendering out uh, together with the borehole and the hydraulic testing. We'll be continuing the geophysical imaging, the seismic noise measurements, and all of that to bring uh, forward the different models that we would like to produce for the region. Thanks a lot uh, for listening. Thank you very much, Frédéric, for this uh, great presentation. What can I say? Well, this is a huge project and you now understand that this U original consortium is really mandatory to, to be able to realize such uh, activities. I will now go on in my presentation and I will end this meeting by uh, inviting you, well, mainly all the industrial partners, inviting you to the first ET Industrial Advisory Board 
that would be organized in December. So are you a company, SME or other, or a cluster of, of uh, industry active in this field for the prototype or in these fields for the geology aspect? you must come and join us. And the first uh, industrial advisory board will be organized beginning of December. I will make a doodle and I will invite everybody. We will organize it twice a year. It will be led by the ETES and ET Pathfinder project partners. And these are the participants we are willing to invite. And also local and regional authority are really welcome. So please express your interest and register via our website with the online form in the industry tab of the menu. So I just wanted to say a few words because there is a big ecosystem around uh, e-test and I wanted to tell you that we have been working hard on a new ET to SMEs project that is under submission. It is in the submission of the call six of the Interreg 5 EMR program, Axis One Innovation, and it's an umbrella project. The objective is to maximize the social and economic impact of the implementation of the Einstein telescope in the extended Eurasia Mesrine. We submitted here the first phase on the 14th of September, and we will do the final submission the 10th of November. The project timing would be two years and a half starting in March, with a total budget of 2.3 million euro, and involving the four region umbrella budget. And then, as it is an umbrella budget, we have a voucher envelope of 1 million euro dedicated to the Euregional SMEs that would be financed at 50% by the FEDER and 50% by the company themselves. This is our consortium. And you will see that the four regions are covered. We have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven direct partners. This project is coordinated by Agit. We have also associated partners in each uh, region. Uh, expression of interest from all, all region and we have also sectorial agencies who are supporting us. So we see we received a lot of support from everybody in each region. Well, and I will just present you the project in one slide. ET to SME, a cross-border value chain for our innovation. This is how we will build the project. We will start by a huge mapping of all the companies active in the field of technology requested by the Einstein telescope. Then we will do an active business development support by visiting company, networking, building consortium between these companies and new regional companies that maybe don't know each other. Then we have these attractive fundings to offer them 1 million euro as a voucher to create innovation project, EMR cross-border innovation project. And finally, we want to make this advisory board uh, sustainable. So we want it to go on even after the end of this project to be ready and effective for the construction, the implementation and, and operation of the Einstein telescope. So this is in a nutshell, the project that we have in submission focusing mainly on the economy in the Eurogeomers Rhine. And uh, well, this is a wink, but did I tell you already that ET2 SME is under submission? Well, you know what I want for Christmas, huh? <laughs> so uh, now I really want to thank Interreg because Interreg is the Euro European Union's tool to support the cross-border project, which otherwise would not be carried out. And this was really the case of e-test. Interreg has already invested more than 1 million euro in the development of the region uh, until the end of this program five. The e-test project is carried out under the Interreg EMR Eurasia Mesrine program with seven and a half million coming from the FEDER. And by investing EU funds in interact project, the European Union invests directly in economy development, innovation, territorial development, social inclusion, and education in the Eurasia Mesrine. A big, big thanks 
to all the financiers in Terag, but also all the co-funding region that really without them, we could not be there, here. And of course, all the partners who also invest financially and, all, and invest with all their work and scientific knowledge. And the final word, I will leave it to Albert because Albert is our very precious partner, always with us, always in our mind. And he is the best to close this meeting. Dear world citizens, as you probably know by now, space and time are relative components. It's imagination that made it possible for me to cross borders. More than a century ago, I defined a theory of gravity and predicted the existence of gravitational waves. I couldn't imagine at that time that scientists would actually prove my theory. In 2015 they did and, wow, it opens a new field of research. I lived and worked in exciting times, but so do you. Scientists are about to build the Einstein telescope that can detect gravitational waves to explore the whole universe and listen even to the Big Bang. And the best place to build this Einstein telescope appears to be in the border region of Belgium, Germany and the Netherlands where the best conditions and the brightest people meet. By the way, thank you for naming this telescope after me. Ah well, keep up the good work and as you know, imagination is more important than knowledge. I expect to hear from me in the future. Thanks a lot, Albert, you're really the best. I think this was the best way to close this meeting. And now we go to the question answer session. I think you can maybe put your camera on so that we see a little bit who and maybe raise your hand if, uh, if you want uh, to ask a question and uh, we can already maybe look uh, into the into the chat mm. so will the slide be available after the meeting yes of course because we are recording this uh, kickoff meeting so everything will be available and will be published on the website then what do i see uh, from Jan Vermeeren. Jan, maybe Vermeeren, can you talk about what is the driver to go to 10 Kelvin? Hello? So one of the questions, do you all hear me? Okay, I was putting on my camera and not the microphone. Sorry for yeah. that. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Uh, one of the things is we have worked in the past on uh, several deep cryogenic detectors, uh, amongst others for ISOFOT and FIRST. And one of the observations there is that below 35 Kelvin, you get into a um, freeze-out freeze regime for uh, silicon uh, electronics, uh, which is causing, say, kink effects. And even with precautions, uh, an increased uh, noise performance. That's the reason why I was asking if, let's say, uh, most of the electronics can be operated above 35K because you are then in a much better uh, temperature regime than uh, if you have to operate 10 Kelvin. Yes, and then then ask uh, my partners from the project because here all the ULG team is with the journalists, you know, for the press conference and I'm alone. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if uh, Florian, uh, Frank, uh, can I, I can take this if you don't mind, Anik. So yes, please, Stefan, do. <laughs> Hi, Florian. So, so I think there's a little bit of a misunderstanding. So the silicon mirrors 
are really kind of completely passive. There will be no electronics, uh, nothing, nothing else in there. So it will really be just a piece of, of, of chunk of, of silicon to sit there as a, as a gravitational reference mass in space time. So there will be no electronics in there. We don't want to have any free charges in there. Actually, that's one of the good things going even further down in, 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 in temperature. So it will not produce any noise in, in that sense of, of the charges. And all of our electronics, or nearly all of our electronics, apart from some, 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 some specialities, will usually be at room temperature or, as you say, be operated at, at much higher cryogenic temperatures. So there's no intention to have electronics at 10 Kelvin. Okay, that's great. Okay, thank you. Then I see uh, I see a question from Serge Godard. When the construction will take place in your figure on slide 17? I Sorry. think the current, the current plan is to start the drilling kind of fairly quickly, quickly meaning within kind of, you know, rather uh, one, two, three years rather than five years from the site decision. So I, I would hope something like, like 2027 or something like, like this, yeah. Yeah, you, you see 26, you start. And then just the drilling of the tunnels and the underground caverns and so on will take several years. I think in the, in the latest uh, engineering, I think we estimated five years just for building the caverns. And then obviously you need to build all of the technologies, the vacuum system and so on. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And then the exploitation will be done from 34. Yeah. So you have uh, how many years of, of construction? I, I think we estimate around uh, 10 years or less. 10 years. Uh, depends on how you put the, 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 the end of the construction and the start of the commissioning. So yeah. the, the total between start of, of construction and hopefully start of real operation, scientific operation, uh, mm -hmm. we hope to be within 10 years. And then the, the really scary thing that people sometimes forget to think about is we want to operate the Einstein telescope for 50 years. So the current uh, decommissioning date, in, as stated in the S3 roadmap, is 2085. Uh -huh. Eight, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And then I have a, a question from Christian Diric. Uh, so the site selection does not only depend on the geological characteristic of the site. Because uh, maybe Annika is, can say something. I, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I think he's, he's absolutely right with his question. It's not only depending on the geology, as I have presented. There's a lot of other boundary conditions we have to, uh, to integrate in the site selection procedure. As I said, this is a distance to noise producing infrastructure. It is protected area, this urban areas. So we cannot place um, yeah. infrastructure wherever we want because the geology is good. So we have to find a, a good solution uh, uh, between all this site selection criteria. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, then I have a question from Jo van den Brandt. Temperature of silicon mirrors must be that low to have an excellent sensitivity. Low, low thermal noise. It's maybe not a question, it was a... It an answer, answer, to, an answer to the previous question, yes. Exactly. And I think this was covered, yes. Oh, great. Okay. And then I had uh, Conor Moulauri who said the final stage suspension of the mirror is, an, is a simple pendulum. The design is not finalized, but it will have a length of about one meter, so approximately half a hertz resonant frequency. And uh, there are many other eigen modes uh, of the larger structure. This is also answer to my question. Okay, great, great. So uh, another question from Jan uh, Vermeeren. As we are working on very long time frame, what about the, avail the availability of the, is it helium supplies, HE? Uh, yes, indeed. Question is, are you going to, let's say, consume helium in those large cryostats? Yes or no? Uh, if yes, uh, are you sure that we that there is sufficient helium available on Earth uh, till what I've heard now, 2080? I think this this question refers to the, the general availability of, of helium, which is obviously, you know, something that many many experiments running kind of large cryogenic systems uh, are, are concerned about um ju just to be clear all we want to do 
and this is not finalized, the exact cooling is not really finalized. That's one of the things that e-test and, and then subsequently also et pathfinder want to find out will obviously use closed helium systems. So I don't think, you know, I mean, you need to fill them once up and you're not blowing it out into the air, but you recycle this. So in that sense, I think uh, there won't be any kind of big limits on that. Not sure if that was the question. Yeah, okay, fair enough, thanks. Okay, so let's go on. Uh... So I just explain also to you that uh, this Kiskov will be uh, registered completely and published on our website. Then I have a question from uh, Tractable, Mr. Gofrio. Actually running regional seismotectonic study and seism seismic studies could assist WP4 database improvement and technical discussion. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Good morning. Uh, yes, Hello. The, the meaning was uh, we we have ongoing uh, studies regionally that could assist with the project. Uh, and I was wondering, this was, was my last question, uh, is there any real um, uh, seismic hazard assessment and uh, relative to active faulting and uh, earthquake issues that could be uh, that will be run in, in the frame of the project? Anika, I can answer if you want. Yes, please. Yeah, thanks, uh, first of all, for uh, for your wish to collaborate with us. We are very, very happy to collaborate with the uh, industry and uh, we are happy to, to learn also from the work you are doing. Uh, regarding your question, yes, uh, this is an important aspect and we, we're working on that. That not my working group here is a, is a, a group also in Everton Aachen who is working on neotectonics and active tectonics. So we collected already all available information about um, uh, former historically earthquakes in the, in the region. And uh, this also helps us for other things to constrain, for example, the stress state and stuff like that. So this is an important aspect what you raise here and uh, we're working on that. Thanks. Welcome to collaborate uh, whenever needed. Yes, we are in anyhow in contact. <laughs> And then I have Bjorn who said hard rock from uh, Famenian and... Uh... Yes, Annick, uh, this was just an add-on on uh, the presentation of uh, Frederic. Ah, okay. Uh, and this, uh, this rock uh, gives us the best fighting chance to construct the Einstein telescope. Okay, okay, thank you. Then uh, uh, Stefan who said I can take this, yeah. We start the drillings around 2027. This, this would be the drilling to start building the Einstein telescope, huh? Yes, yeah, yeah. That was a comment when we started the, the question section. So, so, so oh, okay. you see it's an answer from, from the earlier part. Then uh, Laurence Delplace from uh, Amber Engineering. How long, how deep will be the tunnel, the, the shaft? What about the geometry, diameter of I, the tunnel? I, I can also answer this, Anik. Yes. Thanks for the question. Um, there's not a unique answer for it. Uh, we are talking about a depth range between 250 and 300 meters where uh, the triangle should be constructed. So we need access shafts or inclined access shafts to come down to these depths, which might have a diameter somewhere between 10 and 12 meters. And then we reach uh, the corner points of the triangle. And um, there, there's a, a large coverage. I can give you numbers for this at the moment. We think of uh, coverage which have a height of 30 meters with a span of 20 meters, with, which are the biggest ones. And then there's a long TBM drive, most likely a TBM drive between the corner points. And there it depends on which options we want to take for the support and support measures. We are in the range between seven and eight meters diameter because we need a clearance inside of, a, of around five and a half meters uh, to host all uh, these instruments. Mm -hmm. I hope I could answer your question so far. And it's not uh, uh, in stone, right? What I, what I tell you at the moment, because this is uh, part of the project at the moment, but these are the numbers I can give you for, for now. Thank you, thank you. And then from uh, Antonia uh, Cornaro, in what cir circumference of the subsurface will you not be able to build in the underground? 
I can also answer this. Um, um, I, it, it's hard what I say now. I, I think uh, with all engineers in, in, in this room now, they will agree. Uh, eventually, we can we can build everything, right? It, um, it, it is a matter of the costs and how it looks like and the geometry looks like at the end of the day, but we can build it. But we want to, of course, build in a very cost-effective way. And that's why we look for the most suitable geology in the region that we can also save money on the underground construction. Um, of course, there is um, there's some uh, challenges coming up when we go into the underground, but when you want to build a big carbon, of course, you would like to avoid uh, large uh, fault zones and stuff like this, but this is all, all the outcome of, of this first uh, study we are doing now. Um, when we move uh, the carbon a little bit, we rotate it a little bit in a different direction, but this is something we can uh, deal with. I, I hope I could answer your question. Thank yes, you. thank you very much. And then I have a question from Laurence Delplace from Amberg Engineering. How can we, industry companies, be part of the project and support you? Well, I think I already answered a part of it. It's via the industrial advisory boards that we will organize. So it's kind of a meeting with only companies and uh, also with direct contact with the teams and also with all the procurements that we will publish on the website and see if you can apply for this uh, uh, RFP. And uh, does uh, maybe one of the scientists want to add something for the collaboration between the scientific and the companies in direct during the project? Yeah, I can just repeat what I said. We are super happy to collaborate with uh, yeah. industry partners. And we have established already, and I think it's still ongoing, an advisory board where uh, industry partner can uh, can uh, collaborate uh, with us. Unfortunately, at the moment, this is will be unpaid, uh, so it's kind of a volunteer uh, yeah. uh, collaboration. Um, but uh, absolutely happy uh, to welcome everybody in there and get advice. Yes, I, 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 yeah, I was to I want to precise it. This is for free. The participation to the advisory board uh, is, is for free and it's not also, it's not paid. Eh? It's a, a scientific and a meeting. It's, um... So I have a question uh, from uh, Joseph uh, Ickmans. Uh, do you also need assistance advice regarding tunnel drilling techniques? I think the the question goes in the in the same direction, right? Is uh, the advisory board, um, and I repeat it. Of course, we are happy to discuss this mm -hmm. with the expert from the industry. And then a question from Christian Diric: The National Geological Institute of Belgium has also large competence for that region. See earlier gas storage exploration activities. Yeah, this is exactly why I love uh, this venue today, because now everybody can tell us what they have, uh, because this is really key for us uh, to collect yeah. all of, uh, this, uh, this um, experience and all this data. And we are happy to integrate this in our, uh, our cross-border model. Yes, please don't hesitate to contact me if you want per email or if you go on the website, you have the name of all the researchers and please contact them. And if you have something to share as data, please do it. We are really so happy that uh, you would do that. So Christian Diric also said the big science Belgium technology platform powered by Agoria is happy to collaborate with Einstein Telescope in the search for all type of technology suppliers and cross fertilization from other big science projects. That's uh, Thank really, you. Thank thanks you. a lot. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And uh, we are very happy from this kind of uh, for this kind of message. I think I've been through all the chat. Yes. Has somebody got a, a last question? Mm, don't hesitate. Don't be shy. No. <laughs> no. Antonia, Antonia from Amberg Engineering also ah, uh, sent okay. an email that she is happy to share uh, their experience with large carbon. 
constructions. Thank you, Antonia. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. Yes, thanks for a lot for this session. It was very informative and we will be very happy to um, stay in touch with the various parties. We have offices in Belgium and Germany, so that's Perfect. very handy. Yeah. Thank you very much. We are waiting for your contact and then uh, we, we will meet in December anyway. Unfortunately, it will be virtual again uh, due to the situation. Uh, yeah, but it's better than nothing. You see, we are all of us, we are going on working coronavirus won't stop us and uh, we will see you soon all of you thanks then, a lot very well organized session thank you thank you very much and thanks this is this is really what i want to tell you thank you and thank you and danke schön and merci to all of you to make this uh, yeah this kickoff possible and uh, don't hesitate really if you have any information, if you want more info, contact us. So I think this is time to say bye bye. And uh, I have I say many, many thanks to all of you. I wish you a very nice end of the day and uh, let's go on the great work. And see you, see you soon, see you soon. Okay, I think we can, we can, and this meeting and it was a very nice one to my opinion thanks a lot thanks a lot thanks bye. to all of you bye bye cheers bye 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 thank you so much bye, bye. thank you bye thank you